Итак, прежде чем мы с вами вновь начнем исследование so of our treasure, our inheritance that is in Christ Jesus, the unchanging epigraph of our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word of God in what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can put on the new form of life. The book of Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That you, and this is not the only place of scripture, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. To fulfill this command, as we already know, we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs that has be, have become the subjects of our study to put off, be renewed, and put on. We've noted that your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting actions to put off, be renewed, and put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath, or more specifically, will the occurrence of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it and our names be forever blotted out of the book of life, although they may have been written there at one time. In a specific format, we have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the following question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. And when we see, speak of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ in the all armor of light, we've concluded that we need God's help in the form of his redeeming mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God is the weaponry of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. Since prayer isn't just a man's means of communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God, man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the territory of earth. Considering, therefore, that the most powerful form of prayer is continual prayer that does not back away from its goal until what is asked for is received, we together have been studying the format of continual prayer in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest, being a continual remembrance or memorial before God. The power of such a prayer is called to demonstrate the unlimited authority of God over our genesis in the allotted by him for his time and boundaries. Due to this, we came to the necessity to study the goal God pursues in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer and also in what way and upon what conditions God is able and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man can present the interests of God in the implementation of his inheritance in God. According to the revelations of Scripture, our prayer as warriors in prayer are identified in the virtue of twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, and our prayer needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with the faith of our heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. In the previous services, we in a specific format have already looked at the essence of the first eight components that identify the state of the heart of a warrior in prayer, as well as the quality of his prayer, and stopped to study the ninth component, quality of continual prayer, 
This is the presence of the fear of the Lord in your prayer or prayer that is made in the fear of the Lord. But first, I would like to once again present the antonyms or opposite qualities of prayer that have already been a part of our studies, because understanding the context or background of each quality, we will better understand the quality and character of true prayer. The antonym of continual is unfaithful or not continuing. The antonym of persistent is resistant. The antonym of diligent is lazy. The antonym of boldness is audacity. The antonym of reverence is forsaking and hatred. The antonym of the faith of God is unbelief or resisting the faith of God. The antonym of thanksgiving is unthankful or hard-hearted. The antonym of joy is sorrow and brokenness that dries the bones. And the antonym of the fear of the Lord is the fear of man. As in the previous qualities of prayer, it is necessary for us to look at four classical questions. First, from what wellspring does the fear of the Lord flow and what qualities or criteria does the fear of the Lord have. Second, what purpose is the fear of the Lord supposed to fulfill within our relationship with God, with each other, and with all of the world? Third, what price or what conditions do we need to fulfill so we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer? And fourth, by what results do we need to examine ourselves on the presence of the fear of the Lord within our heart? In the previous services, we in a specific format already studied the essence of the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. I, in short formulations, will remind us of the essence of the fear of the Lord, which is contrary to the fear of man. We've noted that the fear of the Lord and the fear of man are two absolutely different programs that come from two diametrically opposite wellsprings, identifying the program of eternal life that comes from God, containing the quality and the nature of God, and the program of eternal death that comes from the entrails of the fallen cherubim, containing his qualities and his nature. We know that the first Adam, due to his disobedience to God, was transformed into the programmable system of the fallen angel and inherited from him a program opposite of God's fear, which was passed down to all mankind and became to be called the fear of man. The character included in the fear of the Lord, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in Scripture for creating prayer as a commandment as a direct order, a military command that is to be fulfilled. If unfulfilled, the verdict is death. That is a final break of our peaceful relationship with God. The fear of the Lord as a program identifying the life of God is identified as a spring of the wisdom of God and as a keeper and demonstrator of this wisdom. And as a program, it is able to exist and demonstrate itself in nothing else but a programmable system, identifying the wisdom of the heart of one that is born from God that becomes a possessor of a faithful mind abiding in the commandments of the Lord. Psalm 110.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. And so if the Lord, if a person does not fulfill the commandments of the Lord, this means that he has an unfaithful mind or that something is not in order in the mind. We've noted that the reason for many misconceptions and wrongs is what our, de our mind is dependent upon or from. If we place our mind in dependence of men, we will be pleasing because of our weakness, their ignorance, and their religious ambitions. If we place our mind in dependence of the traditions of man, then for the sake of those traditions, we will remove or move the commandment of God aside. If we place our mind in dependence of logical or a rational form of thinking or obtained experience, we will also be far from the fear of the Lord. Although the fear of the Lord as the wisdom of God isn't against logical or a rational form of, of mentality, but due to its eternal existence and exalted nature in the fourth dimension, it does not depend on a logical form of thinking and governs logic. Therefore, only when we, contrary to many human authorities, place our mind in dependence from the revelations of Scripture, that is when we will be able to be filled with the fear of the Lord demonstrated in His divine and exceeding wisdom. We know well that the world we live in has many forms of existing fear and even more phobias. And practically, the entire world is underpinned by fears and phobias. 
But all of these forms of fear come from one wellspring, the fallen cherubim. These fears were inherited from the first Adam when he sinned and were passed on genetically to all mankind. And further, all of these forms of fear do not parallel or identify with the unique and great nature of fear that comes from God and is passed down by right of birth from God to man. We need to keep in mind that there is also a healthy form of fear that exists in the form of healthy thinking that does not yield suffering. Any form of fear that does not come from God yields suffering. At the same time, the fear of the Lord prompts a trembling reverence before God and an unexplainable admiration or delight as it places man in the safest place called God. As it is written, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, this is talking about the God's uh, love, agape, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 1 John 4.18 Therefore, if our worship is done out of the boundaries of the fear of the Lord, which contains the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, then it cannot be accepted by God. And so a person who does not know the elementary principles of Christ that came in the flesh will never be able to worship in the fear of the Lord. He'll be in the likeness of Hagar, he'll pray in the wilderness, and sometimes God will respond, not for the sake of Hagar, but Ishmael for whom Abraham prayed. But this person will think all his life that he prays and God hears him, and he will remember that in those years, God has spoken, had spoken to me, but he doesn't speak to me now. And so, that is specifically why any attempt to enter, enter the presence of God, to call upon God, or to serve God without the presence of the fear of the Lord, deeply offends God, does not consider God, and actually resists God. The absence of the fear of the Lord within the heart of a man testifies about the fact that this person is bound by the fear of man or human fear. Revelations 21.8 talks about how these people will be marching first in the parade to hell and all of the rest of the wicked and unclean or lawless people will follow after. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderer, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. From there it will not be possible <clears throat> to come out or to repent or to do s or change something. The word fear, wisdom, and commandment when it comes to the nature of God are identical as they identify the moral virtues of God. And because they are identical, the one word describes the other word as they come one from the other and authenticate one the other. This is specifically why the fear of the Lord is the true wisdom of God presented in the commandments of the Lord. At the same time, true wisdom in the commandments of the Lord is identified as the fear of the Lord identifying the given law of God. And now third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill so we can be filled with the fear of the Lord in prayer and abide within the fear of the Lord? In a specific format, we've studied five conditions that are necessary in order to abide and be filled with the fear of the Lord and will today study the sixth condition. I will remind us that the boundaries of the fear of the Lord as a program of God is the boundary of the heart of a person that fears God, as the heart is a programmable system for the fear of the Lord. The first condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the necessity to clothe yourself into the mantle of a student of, of Christ, raising or elevating a person to the status of a servant of the Lord. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalm 34, 11. If a person does not have authority, a spirit, uh, the authority of a spiritual father that, the God has, that God has placed or sent, he will never be able to learn the fear of the Lord because he needs to learn. The fear of the Lord is the elementary principles of Christ. Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. This is the given law of God that uh, includes all of the commandments of the Lord. The second condition for receiving in the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is having a pure heart cleansed from dead works. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works and to serve the living God? Hebrews 9, 13, 14. The third condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart consists in honoring the Word of God and treating the Word of God presented in the name of God and the given law of God as God honors and treats His own Word. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. Psalm 138, 2. I shall remind us that the holy temple is the holy body of a person, and that is specifically where God magnifies his word above all his name, and he magnifies it with the agreement of the person, if a person does not collaborate with God to magnify his word above all his names, then it will not happen. Because everything that God does, he does with the participation of man and his willingness to participate. The fourth condition for receiving and abiding and being filled with the fear of the Lord in your heart is the necessity to be a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch that grows out of its roots. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. Fifth condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the requirement to be an organic member of Zion. Isaiah 33, 5, 6. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times, and the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord, is his treasure. Sixth condition for receiving the seed of the fear of the Lord into your heart is the necessity to humble yourself in accordance to the demands of the will of God that are written in the commandments of the Holy Scriptures. Proverbs 22, 4. And this is not, of course, the only place of Scripture. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. To determine the condition for abiding in the fear of the Lord, it is necessary to examine yourself on the presence of humility, which provides God a foundation or grounds to lead us into the inheritance of the treasure of His fear. As much as we know humility, the quality that the fear of the Lord follows, is the willingness and ability to fulfill the will of God, and this nature of humility is defined by the state of brokenness of our spirit and trembling before the word of God that comes out of God's mouth. And if the circumcision of the foreskin was the seal of righteousness upon the body of a man, then a broken spirit in circumcision of the heart is the seal of the righteousness in the spirit of a man. Therefore, a person that does not possess a broken spirit in the form of a circumcised heart will never be able to produce the fruit of humility in obeying the will of God. In result, no one <clears throat> can possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord, abide within the fear of the Lord, or be filled with the fear of the Lord. And this nature of humility comes from gentleness that is learned from Christ. Matthew 11, 29, 30 Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light Matthew 11, 29, 30 In other words, humility demonstrated in the brokenness of our spirit, being the circumcision of our heart, serving as the seal of righteousness in our spirit before God, is the result of gentleness de demonstrated in a conscious and voluntary discipline 
of our mouth. It is this nature of humility that is the condition for us abiding and being filled with the fear of the Lord. And for us to possess such a nature of humility that is ready and able to confront the desires of the flesh and thoughts, being supported by organized powers of darkness, for the sake of fulfilling the will of God, it is necessary to study and get to know the will of God every day upon the conditions of Scripture and within the order implemented in Scripture. Otherwise, how can we demonstrate our humility in obeying something that we cannot clearly identify? Therefore, humility is first of all an active resistance against your corrupt desires, which are being supported by organized powers of darkness, attempting to avert or turn us away from fulfilling the will of God. And secondly, humility is the act of an active application of pressure upon the organized powers of darkness for the purpose of thrusting them out from within the boundaries that are under their control, but according to the promise of God belong to us and are supposed to be our inheritance and the inheritance of our children. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Ephesians 5:17. Through 21. And when this place of scripture is read, the, the alcoholics uh, then are comforting themselves with saying that, well, I don't get drunk. I sometimes will take one glass or two. I'm not in a bar. What difference does it make if you're in a bar or not? I can be in a bar, uh, drink a, a soda and go home, but at home you'll drink uh, wine and go to hell. It doesn't matter where you're drinking it, it's important what you're doing, the state you're in. When it says, do not be drunk with wine, that means do not be satisfied by it, do not, do not take it in or drink it, but not that not to drink too much. So pretty much you're interpreting as don't drink as much wine, from which there's dissipation. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means be obedient to the revelations of the Holy Spirit or be led and guided by the revelations of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit explains the essence of the elementary principles of Christ contained in symbols and proverbs in allegories and prophecies of the Holy Scriptures. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord means exclusively within the boundaries of hierarchical subordination outlined within the boundaries of the commandments of the Lord. If people truly think that you need to submit one to the other, you obey one another, so parents are to then obey their children, children their parents, a uh, husband needs to obey the wife, wife the husband. So the scriptures, uh, I, uh, it's as if contradictory to other places of scripture. So the fear of the Lord is an order, a hierarchical subordination of who needs to obey who. Humility, the condition of abiding in the fear of the Lord, is the ability to rule within the boundaries of your responsibility. First to rule over yourself within the fear of the Lord, presented in the commandments of the Lord. The purpose is to subject the aspect of your emotions so that they fulfill the will of God. We will keep in mind that there is a significant difference between when God humbles us and when we humble ourselves. An example of active humility fulfilling the will of God, we turn to a part of one of, God, of a God-inspired place of Scripture where humility is shown confronting the organized powers of darkness and applying pressure upon powers that hate the will of God. Psalm 144, 1-2. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. We've noted that God can only teach a student who inclines his ear to listen to the word of God who is enlightened to the learner. An inclined ear that is prepared to listen to the word of God is that good and great nature of humility. This humility is the condition for obtaining the fear of the Lord and is 
an ultimate beauty before the eyes of God. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear, forget your own people also, and your father's house, so the king will greatly desire your beauty, because he is your Lord, worship him. Psalm 45, 10, 11. If the ear of the heart of man is not inclined to listen to the word of God, then God will not have the grounds to awaken this ear so that man can hear God within his heart in the likeness of the learned. Isaiah 54, the Lord God has given me. Isaiah here is talking about Christ, or Jesus is speaking. More accurately, Jesus is speaking. And Isaiah writes it, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord has opened my ear, and I did not resist. According to this place of Scripture, we conclude that to waken the ear in indicates a status linked to resurrection that was preceded by the act of humbling yourself to the death and the death of the cross. And this state of humility can only be possessed by a man with a broken spirit, because the brokenness of the spirit is not just a mark of righteousness before God, which is the circumcision of the heart, but also a mark of the covenant, upon the grounds of which God is able to awaken the ear of a man, so that this man can listen to the word that comes out of the mouth of God. The brokenness of a man's spirit as a testimony of humility indicates the poverty of his spirit, where a person consciously and willingly refuses all protection and all reliance upon something or someone for the benefit of relying upon God. If this man does not possess humility in his spirit, demonstrated in the readiness and ability to be as the learned, then God fulfills the verdict of eternal death over this person. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. In Scripture, the word life is always uh, implies a resurrection. And so when it speaks of health to all the flesh, obtained because of humility, demonstrated inclining the ear to listen to the word of God, it will then be health to every cell of the body. Again, this demonstrated inclining the, inclining the ear to listen to the word of God, health to all the flesh, this means making the resurrection of Christ ruler in our body by the means of which our body is then liberated from the law of sin and death. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understandings that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. Proverbs 5.1.2 A pure mouth that keeps the knowledge of wisdom that comes from above is the concluding and triumphant moment of the final reign of the resurrection of Christ demonstrating the throne of God and the Lamb within our body. It is, and it is this uh, at this time that our mouth and our words become equal in power to the words that come out of the mouth of God. It is this nature of humility before the will of God that David had as well as Jesus, being the root and the offspring of David. Considering all of this, we will be studying the subject of active humility in the time when David obtained authority over his nation, where we see symbol of our obtaining receiving authority or power over our personal fleshly essence or our governing our genesis, so that we demonstrating active humility would present our body as a tool of righteousness, so that we, we with success would step upon all of the powers of the enemy in the form of poverty, illness, and untimely death, which we inherited in our genesis from the sin life of our fathers. Returning to the words of David, the Lord subdues my people under me, we began looking at the responsibility we have for our calling, which is to carry our cross. We've noted that these two phrases, to fulfill our calling and to carry our cross, are tightly linked, since the one phrase explains the other phrase. Because to carry your cross while following Jesus is to fulfill your calling as Christ fulfilled his calling by carrying his own cross.
потому любит меня Отец, что я отдаю Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. John 10, 17, 18. Therefore, our humility consists in us according to the conditions of God and in accordance to his order, collaborating with God so that he subdue our, under us our calling in the form of our nation, which indicates the obedience of our feelings. In Hebrew, the, to subject or subdue is to make obedient, to overcome, to take, to obtain, to rule, to govern, to stomp upon, or to trample upon. The thing is that in Scripture, the verb subdue is used as it relates to its genesis means that our genesis begins to bless us. When the verb subdue is used in regard to our enemies, then it means that we will stomp and trample upon them as dirt in the streets. Answering the second question, what purpose is there in obtaining authority over your nation from which we ourselves come in our relationship with God? to reign over our body as much as we've established the criteria of governing over your genesis is the mutual obli obligation of God and man that each side is called to fulfill where each side needs to be vigilant of their words and fulfill them timely. Answering the third question, what conditions do we need to fulfill to be clothed into humility before the will of God and pay the necessary price for the treasure of the fear of the Lord? We came to the conclusion, we in a specific form have already looked at two conditions, and I will remind us of them and sum summarize them, and afterwards we will turn to study the third condition. Fulfilling the third condition is the price for the right to ab abide and be filled with the fear of the Lord. First, humility demonstrated in vigilance over the words of faith of the heart, which we confess to receive the right to possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord, consists in honoring all of the commandments of God given to us so that we acquire the earth of our body. Deuteronomy 11.8 Therefore you shall keep everything every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. And so the commandments were given so that a person would become strong with these commandments and go and possess the land. We have noted that the acquisition or possession of the earth of our body lies on the other side of the Jordan, which we need to cross, so that by the power of the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, obtained in the resurrection of Christ, we, being on the other side of the Jordan, can begin liberating our body from the law of sin and death, and doing so acquire the earth of our body. Second, humility demonstrated in vigilance over the words of faith of the heart, which we confess to receive the right to possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord, and doing so enthroned the resurrection of Christ in our body consists in not being jealous of the one who is successful in his ways, a wicked person, but rather obey the Lord and trust upon him, waiting for the fulfillment of his promises. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Psalm 37, 7. According to the buffered place of Scripture, to produce the fruit of humility in obedience and hope upon God is... It is necessary to not be jealous of the success of another person in his way, a person that is wicked. And so a person, using his wicked ways, he reaches goals uh, uh, quicker or faster. A person who brings wicked schemes to pass is what you can call a filigree form of corruption, where a person, in order to benefit his public appearance or his greed, unnoticeably, even for himself, replaces or changes out the meaning of the commandments, condemning them and behaving against the law of God and disobeying the law of God. In doing so, this person defiles himself and prepares himself for destruction and wounds the hearts of those that are under his responsibility. Humility demonstrated in obedience to the faith of God is possible upon one condition if we will be armed with wisdom in order to, to perform good and simplicity that you can so you can confront evil. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Romans 16, 19. According to this place of scripture, the fruit of humility is the result of wisdom, able to perform good, and the result of simplicity that is able to react cor correctly to evil.
Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10, 16. And so simplicity and wisdom is what children have. They do not hear the voice of men who speak negatively against their parents and follow only the voice of their mother and differentiate this voice from thousands of others. Wolves are not people of this world, but people that attempt to overtake the authority of God, of God's delegated persons by perverting and resisting the, thr the truth in the elementary principles of Christ. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Acts 20, 29 through 30. In the original Greek language, the word simple, which is necessary in order to confront, confront and react to evil, the carriers of which are wolves that do not spare the flock, means pure, without guilt, unhateful unharmed or undamaged and this word is used in the Greek literature when talking about precious metals that is gold and silver that do not have foreign particles in them or when talking about pure wine therefore if a person has not presented himself as a programmable system of God to be a carrier and demonstrator of the program of his wisdom and his simplicity then this person will be far from knowing and bearing to God the fruits of humility and consequently, this person will not ever have an understanding and ability to abide in the fear of the Lord. Third, humility demonstrated in vigilance over the words of faith of the heart, which we confess to receive the right to possess the treasure of the fear of the Lord, and doing so enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our body, consists in charging the foreigner interest and not charging your brother interest. To a foreigner you may charge interest, but to your brother you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. Deuteronomy 23.20 20. <clears throat> This is a commandment that was given in order to go and over to overtake the land. Although the words contained in this place of scripture are literal, to observe it only within a literal sense means to remain in the position of service of condemnation. Because in their time, the given commandment gave the nation of Israel the ability to go and overcome the land that God promised to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we occupy the position of service of justification, then the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will receive the right to deliver our body from the law of sin and death, as it is written. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all your fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became an example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play, nor let, nor let us commit sexual immor immorality, as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ, as some some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for admonition upon whom thens of the age have come. Therefore, to give your money with interest to the foreigner and to not give your money to your brother with interest is to demonstrate our humility before God, giving God the basis to clothe us into the essence of his fear. Interest is profit from borrowed money or other valuables that due to specific situations can be more than the amount of money we borrow. We need to keep in mind, sometimes you borrow and the loan that you take, the interest you're paying is greater than the debt you owe. You take a hundred thousand loan, but you're giving three hundred thousand. You're paying them two times more for the debt that you've taken, the loan you've taken. We need to keep in mind that 
Take in mind that in literal terms, this commandment to charge interest and not charge interest means our assistance in helping with the specific need of a foreigner or life need of a brother that includes food, clothing, and rent for his housing. Because of this, the given commandment does not include the opening or supporting of a business where conditions of an agreement need to be need to exist about dividing of profits according to the measure of investment into the project. Money or the equivalent of money given as a loan to a brother without interest charge is that assistance is that assistance that we are called to provide each other providing such assistance we therefore fulfill the commandment of loving one another fulfilling any commandment is testimony of our humility before God providing him grounds not only to lead us into the co- treasure of his fear so we can be filled with the fe- with the fear of the Lord but also to clothe us into the royal mantle of his fear Considering these things, we will not forget that the commandment to loan and charge the foreigner interest and the opposite, not charge your brother (coughs) in the Lord interest, is an expression of our humility before the will of God called to clothe us into the fear of the Lord, which is called to be an army of special purpose for us and the inheritance of the promised land which implies the reign of the resurrection of Christ within our body. Silver, <coughs> silver also in the equivalent of money, they often will call it silver, and so it was generally uh, given by weight. Silver that we are called to give with interest and without interest is a symbol of our salvation, given to us in the format of a guarantee that we are called to invest or turn so that it profits us to bring about our salvation. Israel, the one that this commandment is addressed to, is a symbol of our renewed mind, demonstrating the reign of the mind of Christ within our essence called to control our body. The foreigner is an outlander, a stranger, or a person from a different tribe or other nation who worships the gods of his own nation but lives in the promised land. This person symbolizes flesh and blood, that is our soul that is connected to our nation, to the house of our father, and to its desires. This is a symbol of a foreigner. The brother, the one that you should not give the silver of of our salvation and interest, is a symbol of our new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. Therefore, not eliminating the literal meaning of this commandment, we will look at another symbol included in this commandment that we need to we need in order to for the resurrection of Christ to rule within our body. The symbol of the foreigner in the service of justification, who we are called to give the silver of our salvation in in interest, turning therefore the silver of our salvation to profit, is a symbol of our soul and our mortal body, which is made of flesh and blood. Not looking at the promise of salvation in the redeeming blood of the cross of Christ, flesh and blood in the form of death and corruption received by by inherited sin is not able to enter the kingdom of God. They are redeemed, but they can't inherit the kingdom of God in the way they are. Therefore, denying your own life by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of the, of the flesh and blood by submerging into the death of Jesus Christ, we give our foreigner the one who demonstrates this flesh and blood, the silver of our salvation in interest, or we turn in it to profit us. Profit which we receive as a result of giving our silver of salvation to the foreigner in interest is clothing our soul and your mortal body into salvation, that is, into our new person. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 through 50. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. 1 Corinthians Corinthians 15, 47 through 50. However, the door of our hope, which consists in changing our mortal body created from the earth into, into the image of a heavenly body, being resurrected to meet the Lord in the air, our mortal body will be freed or delivered from the law of sin and death or adopted while being earthly or being made of the dust of the earth. A similar adoption of our mortal body delivered from the law of sin and death will happen at the door of our hope. That is, before rapture happens, we will receive a testimony that we have pleased God, and this testimony will consist of the resurrection of Christ 
Becoming as ruler in our mortal body, I will, I will allow myself to remind us that a similar testimony which consists of being delivered from the law of sin and death was received by Enoch in his time, which gave him the ability to walk for 300 years before God in his mortal body before God decided to take him. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah after he begot Methuselah. Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. Genesis 5, 21 through 24. We've more than once noted that Enoch received the ability to walk before God because of the birth of Methuselah, whose name means driving away death. In other words, in the symbol of Methuselah, we see the symbol of the fruit of the tree of life, by the means of which we are called to be delivered from the law of sin and death. Therefore, we will be ready to meet the Lord in the air when our mortal body, by the means of the law of the spirit of life, contained in the produced by us fruit of righteousness in the form of Methuselah, drives away death, will be freed from the law of sin and death. As it is written, I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from death. O death, I will, I will be your plague, O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from your eyes. Hosea 13:14. And here we also see the potential of redemption by the revelation of the Holy Spirit revealed by Apostle Paul. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of, of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 53-57 According to this place of Scripture, when we will be clothed into immortality and in corruption, then our body will remain earthly because to receive the image of the heavenly uh, body, according to Apostle Paul, will happen during rapture when we meet the Lord in the air. I also want to turn to the book of Hosea where we see the symbol of the silver that we've given to the foreigner. And it also specifies uh, the quality of it or the essence of it. Hosea 2, 4 through 23. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Accor as a door of hope. She shall sing there, and in the day of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and, and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be redeem, remembered by the, their names no more. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, with the creeping things of the ground, Bow and sword of battle I shall shatter from the earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer in the, he the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, with oil. They shall answer just real. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth. I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy, then I will say to those who were my, not my people, you are my people, and they shall say you are my God. Hosea 2, 4 through 23. According to this place of scripture, we see the prophet uh, of the loan that we've given to the foreigner. God will betroth us in righteousness and faithfulness that will allow us to get to know him. And the Lord then will hear the heavens and the heavens will hear the earth and the earth will respond or answer with grain, new wine and oil. The given prophecy that contains the uh, pretty much things that will happen in the future, it's talking about the door of hope here, not rapture, but the door of hope, what will happen before rapture. We see it presented as an allegory. We see here then our collaboration with God 
and the things that are supposed to happen to us before we enter the land that God has promised to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The phrase, I shall allure her and will bring her into the wilderness is a collaborative effort between God and man. God will never do this, never allure her to himself without her agreement and without her participation. We know that in Hebrew, the word wilderness is pretty much uh, lips and a spring which signifies the presence of God. If we expand the meaning of this phrase, we find this definition, I will lead you into my presence, to my wellspring, and to my words, and I will speak to your heart. Considering that in Hebrew the phrase, I will speak, uh, has a lot of definitions and a lot of meanings, uh, and all uh, pretty much uh, talk about the door of hope. When it says, I will speak, when it says, I will speak comfort to her, I will visit her in the wilderness, I will punish her, I will bring her to judgment, I will perform judgment over her, I will ask of her, I will rebuke her. And then after that, I will defend her, I will protect her, I will focus my eyes upon her. I will justify her, I will visit her with blessings, I will clothe her into my virtues. And so when God will lure her into the wilderness, he allure us into the wilderness, we will see the state that we're in and we will become afraid. He will be uh, punishing us, he will correct us, he will perform judgment over us, and then he will defend us. He will protect us from ourselves, uh, from himself, from his wrath. But first he needs to show us who we are. Because at the closeness of God, God a person begins to see who he is or his state. In prophet Isaiah, it's written that God's person, this person of God, he was he feared God greatly. And he also thought about himself that everything was fine. And God spoke with him. But... At one moment, God came very near to him, and when he did this, uh, this prophet became very much afraid and said, I am going to perish. His mouth was unclean and pure, and he suddenly understood that he, uh, he lied a little bit there, here, he, he add, added something here, he took away something here, we uh, add a little bit of a different definition or meaning to something that isn't there, and, and sometimes it says uh, it's your conscience that's burned out in those areas and it needs to be renewed, and, and so we need to be able to see to be able to fix that. The Lord then sent a cherubim with uh, burning coals and he accessed his mouth, he touched his mouth and said that your lawlessness is now uh, taken from you and you're pure. As we talked about, the, the your lips are the throne of, the, of, of God and the Lamb. And also, after the words that we just read, follow the next phrases. I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Akur as a door of hope. She shall sing there in the day of her youth and in the day when she comes up from the land of Egypt. This phrase is the symbol of the return to us loan with the prophet due, uh, due to the interest that we in our time gave to our foreigner. In order to redeem and to adopt our body, we turned our salvation to profit, our silver to profit. And so this, uh, this, this interest or this per these percentages interest that we received as a prophet is the adoption of our body from sin and death. We will also turn to the book of, of Isaiah, where the uh, meaning of silver already now obtained or received back with profit, with benefit, is uh, this, uh, this is more expanded uh, or expanded greatly in this, in this place of scripture. Isaiah 65, 8 through 10. Thus says the Lord, as though new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. 
So will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah and heir of my mountains. My elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and the valley of Accor, a place for herds to lie down for my people who have sought me. Isaiah 65, 10 through 8 through 10. According to this place of scripture, the prophecy of Hosea and Isaiah The silver that we've received back with benefit is the mercy of the Lord and that is pretty much the the vineyards that we've uh, received were not destroyed. God was able to protect or help us protect that's delivering our body from sin and death. When the vine, uh, vines and the grapes have uh, juices, it says, do not harm them, do not destroy them, as it says, when they're clusters, as it says here. God does not want to harm the body. Yes, it's of the world or earthly, but he doesn't want to destroy it. The next element of the loan that was turn, returned to us by our foreigner with prophet is the Valley of Accor. In prophet Isaiah, the blessings of the Valley of Accor is together with the Valley of Sharon. The Valley of Sharon is a fruitful valley that that is uh, near the Hermon Mountains. And the Valley of Sharon is this profit received from the loan that was returned. This is the precious oil of uh, of like-mindedness and of being of one heart. <clears throat> Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore, Psalm 133, 1-3. The dew that comes down from the uh, mountains of Zion is a symbol of the elementary principles of Christ. Give ear, O heaven, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, and my speech distill as the dew, as rain drops on the tender herb, and as a shower on the grass. Deuteronomy 32, 1, 2. Of course, Moses was not talking about the literal... Uh, uh, dew and and raindrops. He was talking about a person and his spirit. Give ear, O heaven, O hear, O earth, O body. The valley of a of a core together with the valley of Sharon as the definition of this loan returned to us with profit is the clothing of our mortal body into the power of the resurrection of Christ. In his time, the Valley of Accor was a place uh, as a memorial for Israel of God's vengeance and justice. This is the time when, if you remember, there was a member of Israel who had taken uh, from the uh, stranger uh, the garments and the silver and then the entire nation was punished for his acts now Joshua said to Akan my son I beg, I, I beg you give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done do not hide it from me and Akan answered Joshua and said indeed I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I have done when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment and so all of the garments and the shekels and everything else was supposed to be given into the temple and 200 shekels of silver a wedge of gold uh, weighing 50 shekels I coveted them and took them and there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it and so again this is in the body he buried it in the earth in his body so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver under it and they took them from the midst of the tent brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord then Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah the silver, the garments, the wedge of gold his sons, his daughters his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep his tent and all that he had and they brought them to the valley of Accor 
And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after that they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore the name of that place has been called the Valley of Accor to this day. Joshua 7, 19-26 <clears throat> so God says at the door of hope I shall give you back this valley of Accor the death of Achan in the valley of Accor together with the holiness of the Lord that's this uh, Babylonian uh, garment that he had taken and the silver and the gold this silver was turned to profit for one reason so that it can be received again in a new form, in a new way, to understand the uh, value of the return to us a uh, prophet, which in, in this garment or symbolizing these garments and the silver and this gold. Uh, we need to shortly look at the meaning of these uh, elements within the body of a person. And so let us now look at this Babylonian garment, this beautiful Babylonian garment. In the Babylonian, uh, in this uh, valley, Babylonian kingdom was in that area as well, in that place. And so this Babylonian garment, which we had turned to profit as the silver that was given with interest in the death of Achan and was returned again in the resurrection of Christ, is a symbol of clothing our earthly body or our mortal body into its new person. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which created according to God into righteousness and holiness. And so now, the holiness in the form of uh, silver, the tw uh, 200 shekels of silver, that we see again that we had invested and we turned to profit and that we gained again this gives us the ability to enter into the temple into the presence of the Lord so that we understand what gives us the right to enter these 200 shekels of silver the capitals which were on top of the pillars in the hall were in the shape of lilies four cubits the capitals and the two pillars also had pomegranates above by the convex surface which was next to the network and there were 200 such pomegranates in rows on each of the capitals all around 200 pomegranates and so this is the fruit then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple he set up the pillar on the right and called its name Jachin and he set up the pillar on the left and called its name Boaz 1st Kings 7 19 through 21 if you remember these are very po uh, very powerful very large pillars uh, they were pretty much at the entryway of the temple and Jachin is made the Lord establish on the right side and Boaz is one who possesses a sharp mind and the power of the spirit this is what these two these, this uh, profit that we receive these 200 shekels of silver and we see them in the 200 uh, such pomegranates as symbol, symbolically the holiness in the form of the gold that we also a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels that we have turned to profit as the silver and we receive back with the uh, with the interest that we had given it with 
The result of all these things will be that our body will become the peace of the Lord or the or the uh, place of God's rest. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your fields nor prune your vineyards. What grows of it of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of the rest of rest for the Lord, and the Sabbath produce produce of the land shall be a food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired men, and the stranger who dwell with you. Leviticus 25, 8-13. <clears throat> and so we have not... Uh, these, again, if you keep reading, it shows here that we... Uh, enemies uh, as a symbol of our body, that we don't rule our body, our... our, our uh, we have destruction, lusts, illnesses, and all kinds of things, so we don't actually govern or rule our body. But now, return this uh, silver uh, or this gold, uh, this pallet of gold uh, that is 50 shekels, in order to uh, receive it back, you need to lose it, give it, and, uh, lose it in the death of the Lord Jesus to then obtain it in a new form. It's very interesting what the Holy Spirit reveals in every commandment of the Old Testament that is given so that we can go and inherit the land, that we inherit our body, so that we return and begin to rule over our body or govern our body, that and not our body that govern us, but we our body. The next element of the loan that was returned to us by our foreigner with profit at the door of our hope is making a covenant with the beasts of the field and in our in our mortal body. All of these things are within our mortal body. And I shall make a covenant in that at that time with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And it's not that literally when the Jesus will begin to rule within our body that God will make a covenant with these uh, animals of the earth. To make a uh, covenant, when it says, I will make a covenant, uh, two sides making a covenant together, uh, God will make a covenant with a person or with man. He will stop the fight or fi uh, or the enmity will stop and uh, terms of peace will be made. And so he was continually battling with us because he found in our body enemies. And making a, a union or making an agreement is that this uh, battle will cease and uh, peace will be made. Uh, pretty much a free migration that we to God and God to us, a mutual uh, agreement and and so any uh, agreement is, is made in this way. The symbol of the beasts and the birds of the air is our, our, our emotional and and wise and, and willing aspects, pretty much our will, our mind, and our emotions. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a lower, little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the path of the sea. <clears throat> o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8, 4 through 9. At one time, God had showed a vision to Apostle Peter, everything that was unclean in the service of condemnation and the body of Christ in the service of justification, God has cleansed it and therefore reconciled in himself, making peace. When the angel spoke to him, had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. 
Agrippa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, and so I can imagine he's at the top, uh, uh, he's praying for six hours and they're cooking under him probably and maybe preparing meat or something that had a good uh, smell or fragrance. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were, they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let them, descending to him and let, and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, Lord, I have never eaten, and eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again and a second time, What well, God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Acts 10, 7-16 birds of the air, the beasts of the field, all these things are within a person. All these things are within our body. And while they're uh, there, the law of sin and death will be. When it's eliminated, then the law of sin and death will have nothing to do there. Jesus in one of his parables showed that this kind of reconciliation or unification at the door of hope is for those or needed only for those who have allowed God to grow the fruit of the tree of life within their heart, that is the kingdom of heaven in their heart. Then he said, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and put in his garden and it, and it grew and became a large tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Luke 13, 18 through 19. And so the birds of the air were in its branches or nested in its branches. It's talking about the uh, uh, obedience of our mind. Oftentimes people say, I can't uh, make my mind obey. My thoughts bother me. They make me afraid. And a lot of people come to me and say this. Pray, I don't know what's going on with me. While I'm at home, at work, it's fine. As soon as I come to church, I, all kinds of thoughts come into my mind. But it says that the birds of the air nest in its branches. <clears throat> they will not uh, bother you. They will be a subject to you. And you will direct them where you want to go, want them to go or what you want them to think. And you will not think of what you don't want to think and you will think of the things you do want to think. The next element of the loan that was turned into a uh, return to us by a foreigner with profit is the elimination of the sword and the bow from our midst so that we can live in safety. And so the sword and the bow are the result of the law of sin and death that abides within our body. And that is why there is always a battle going on at the door of our hope. By the means of casting off the sinful body of the flesh, we will resurrect with Christ by faith in the power of God and the law of sin and death will be destroyed in the form of this sword and this bow. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him, having for forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out all the handwriting of requirements that were against us, which was contrary to us. And he had taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2, 11 through 15. We will continue to study this, <coughs> to study this prophecy. <coughs> I want us to break break it down in more detail uh, so that these words <coughs> will become more and more clear for us. When we're talking about the door of hope, I will do this and I will do this. I'll give you the vineyard, vineyards, the valley of Accor. I'll make peace with you. I will eliminate the sword and this. Uh, you'll begin to understand it better in more detail and you'll be able to see this in yourself in more uh, detail as we study. You will uh, have joy uh, even with your sick body and the things you're being attacked with, you'll begin to see these things and joy will be come. 
This will allow God to see within your heart that clear revelation written there and will allow him to fulfill what is written there because what he reveals to us today talks about the fact that we're living in the last times. We've approached that door of our hope when God is intending <coughs> first to judge us, to show us, to uh, <coughs> that is correct us, and then after that, protect us, justify us, and to clothe us into the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Let us bend our knees, whoever who is comfortable, and we will pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, again and again I worship upon this holy place that your hand had chosen for the worshiping of your name with your holy people that you have chosen for yourself and you paid a price for an immeasurable price for in the blood of your son Jesus Christ to deliver our spirit, our soul, and our body that today is in shame that today is still in the hands of the enemy that today all kinds of viruses and illnesses govern and all kinds of unclean and wicked desires and thoughts arise. But I thank you that in Christ Jesus we already died so that you can reign within our body. We have submerged into the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, to then resurrect with him so that you can rule your resurrection can reign within our body. <clears throat> we thank you that you show us from all angles strengthening our attraction to this promise, our desire to know it, to take this promise, to make it our own, to enter into it. And may your mercy be blessed for your people because everything that you say you will do. You will not step away from the words you spoke until you do or make Jerusalem your glory on earth until you reign within the body of your people and you will bring hell into fear and anger and the unclean that have gathered their own synagogues that say they're Jews but are not so and you will make it that they will come and bow at the feet of your nation that at the door of hope will receive the resurrection of your son in their body when our body will no longer be a laughing stock for the enemy when no one will dare to look at this body and laugh at it or to somehow belittle it or mock it because it will become a carrier of your resurrection and all demons will scatter there where your person will appear that carries in himself your resurrection. This will be a horror on earth for the organized powers of darkness. This will be an unusual panic, and even now they panic, hearing as your nation is being closed into your word, receives it into their heart, begins to consider themselves dead to sin and living to God. We thank you for this revelation. We glorify you for the opportunity to again and again come here to worship before your face together so that you can speak to our heart so that you can refresh and establish us once more so we not step away but be diligent and putting all effort in obtaining the inheritance that belongs to us and that you had inherited for us on the cross with your suffering. We worship before you, our great God. We glorify you 
Father in heaven, <clears throat> that you will do everything that you said. You are faithful to your word. We believe you, we trust in you, and we rely upon you, and we worship before your great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Мы будем петь песню «Любит лишь Христос безмерно». И одна просьба ко всем вам в следующий раз. I would like to make a request either if I'm up here or someone else when we pray our Father pray it out loud with me because it is pleasant when the entire church uh, speaks the same things. And let us finish our service with our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.